thanks for coming. It's really good to see you all here. I hope folks are having a good conference so far. Uh, and a good morning. I know I'm still waking up. <laughs> um, uh, one quick thing to know before we dive in. Um, we do have all around recording here today. Uh, so just know, it's not live streamed, but they are planning on posting this onto their website for other folks to see. Um, so just keeping that in mind, like bring whatever you feel comfortable bringing into the room, knowing that stuff will be recorded. Um, and if there is stuff where you're like, I really want to share this, but I really don't want us to record this bit or whatever, like flag that and we can figure that out as well. Um, yeah, that's uh, just like kind of little basics. Um, but yeah, do you want to bring in some access names and all that? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, thank you all so much for joining us and coming out into a room with limited sunlight um, on a Saturday morning. It's really appreciated. Um, yeah, I think you all all are masked, so thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, we are asking that this is a masked session. Um, uh, yeah, so today we're going to be hanging out for the next like three hours or so. Um, the type of activities that you're going to see, we'll be doing some full group conversation in this circle. We're going to break out into some breakout groups. Um, there might be a little bit of moving around the room. Uh, we will be handing out some worksheets and there will be a Q&A portion to this. Um, so I just wanted to check in to see if anyone has any access needs. You can share them now or um, uh, the way this is structured, there's always going to be one of us not talking, so you can always pull somebody um, if you'd rather talk to somebody personally. Um, so just wanted to make space if anyone wanted to share any access needs that we can accommodate. Yeah. I just might move around from sitting on a chair to the floor to standing, etc. That sounds great, yeah. And I think a, ba a baseline is like, do things that your human body needs to do, so it is a-okay for you to get up, move around, you don't need to ask to use the bathroom, um, or yeah, um, or if you need to stretch or things like that. You might see that modeled by some of us here as well. Yeah. All right. All right. That's that's that section. Yeah. That yeah. Is. I think I do the next one too. Yeah. Great. Right. What, what, what's our deal? Yeah. Who are we? What's our deal? <laughs> um, all right. Great. Um, so hi, we are Obvious Agency. Uh, we are a worker-owned cooperative and a performance company that is dedicated to the creation of an engaging, democratic, and liberatory cultural ecosystem. Um, we do that um, kind of through two branches. One of them is programming. Um, with this, we make interactive, um, interactive performance, often uh, game-like experiences, um, with a primary goal of creating a sense of ownership and uh, ownership and play for our audience members. I feel like we've used the tagline always serious and always silly um, for a lot of this. Um, and you'll see us talk about one of our projects after this. Um, we also do wisdom sharing. Um, so we are doing, we do consulting, workshops like this one, and more. What is more? Well, if you like this, you can talk to us afterwards. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of the things we specialize in are workplace democracy, like what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the solidarity economy and participatory performance. Um, in addition to that, that like kind of falls in between both. We do com we do um, commissioned work for cultural institutions. So um, in Philly, which is where we're based, we've worked with um, Opera Philadelphia and the Barnes Foundation, to name a few of the uh, places that we've made kind of bespoke pieces for. Next one. Um, this is the current show that we're working on. It is called. Space opera. Um, does anybody play D and D or TTRPGs? Hey, hey, Woo! hey! Nerd! Yes, amazing. Um, so, space opera is a live-action TTRPG played by sixty people at a time, set in space. It's played over the course of a month, where as players are making decisions, we are creating live design and story beats in uh, kind of in reaction to that. Um, and Daniel, who is the lead artist, one of the, uh, yes, uh, one of the main tenets of this was actually using TTRPGs as a way for modeling how democracy can work in action and storytelling as we are building worlds together. So you can take those skills that you learn as you're playing and bring them back into your real life. Um, Daniel is lead artist on that project. Um, I'm directing and Sulu and Joe are incredible performer facilitators who have to come up with a lot of, a lot of things on the spot for the show, so thank you. Um, yeah, we currently got the National Theater Project Creation and Touring Grant recently, so 
It'll be, um, it's premiering in Philly in the spring, but we'll be touring to a few other places. And again, you can talk to us afterwards if you're interested in this. Um, yeah, I also um, just wanted to give us a chance to just do a quick line of introduction so you know who we are and what we're doing in the room. If we want to give just name, pronoun, and kind of our relationship to Obvious Agency. I can go first. My name is Kat Ramirez. I use they and she pronouns. I am the Cooperative Operations Manager for Obvious Agency and a worker owner. Uh, oh, both directions. Both directions. <laughs> uh, I'm Joe Ahmed. I use he and they pronouns interchangeably. I am a founding worker owner of Obvious Agency, and I uh, do many things, but I'm currently most focused on our development and fundraising work. Uh, my name is Daniel. You can use he and pronouns for me today. I'll get my badge in a moment. Um, I'm the Cooperative Business Manager with Obvious Agency, and one of the founding worker owners. Welcome. Yeah, uh, and uh, not facilitating today, but a guest speaker here. Hi, um, I'm Sulu Leonim. I use they and them pronouns. Um, I am a guest because I am executive director at Theater View Press NYC, where I'm a joker um, as well, a facilitator of that work. And then um, as a performer facilitator in uh, this obvious agency project, I will name, like, I was a member of the performer facilitator circle and the steering circle. So I'm like kind of putting these kinds of words into the space because this was moving the democratic workplace practices into production that was really intriguing to me as I'm also taking my organization on this journey. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm trying to just insert a little bit of this camera. Like a little bit of some feedback to the space for this. We knew, we knew. So it has some more chairs coming in as we go. I'll just add a couple right now just so that we don't have to do too much. Joe, I can do that so you can. Um, so let's talk about our goals for today a little bit. So I think, the, I think what we're saying is, so this is a survey level sort of 101 course on workplace democracy. Um, I think that being said, we're a pretty small group, and then we know that a lot of people, especially having in the session that's come so far, there's a lot of folks who are thinking about these ideas, who are implementing them in shared leadership structures, other things like that. We're really looking at like, what does this look like for the whole organization, right? What does it look like when we're really incorporating democracy into everything we do? How can we get new tools for that? But I invite you, if you're someone who like is already practicing this in some ways, uh, feel free to like bring that into the room, right? Um, at whatever point you feel it's useful in our conversations at breakout groups, um, because we want to make sure that we're at the edge of what is useful for you to be learning as you're in that piece. Um, so uh, uh, one just housekeeping thing is we will be taking a quick 10 minute break at uh, 11.45, but as always feel free to get up these about and move around if you need to. Um, so our goals for today, we have up here. So we are going to first begin to build a foundational understanding of workplace democracy and democratic management. We are going to learn what demo workplace democracy can look like in practice. We are going to gather tools for implementing and talking about democratic practices in your workplace. And just to get a sense of where the heat is in the room where we're spending our time as we go through, I'd love to get just get a sense of which of these goals folks are most excited about. So if you're, uh, so everyone can raise their hand one time. We'll go through each goal. Um, so if you're most excited about beginning to build a foundational understanding of workplace democracy and democratic management, please raise your hand. That's where the most heat is for you right now. Move <laughs> 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 through that one quick. If you're most interested in learning what workplace democracy can look like in practice, raise your hand. I see Great. hands. Okay. okay. Great. Great. Okay. Good. If you're most interested in gathering tools for implementing and talking about democratic practices in your workplace, please raise your hand. Great. Great. Cool. That is super helpful. So just aiming for us that we're seeing the majority of our heat is in learning about what this looks like in practice and a little bit uh, less but still heat for gathering tools as we're talking about things going. Um, and now, uh, uh, just to get a sense of who's in the room, I'm gonna ask a few questions. I'm gonna ask folks if you feel comfortable to raise your hand, just identify sort of like in your organizations, where are you sort of falling within structure? Um, so if you are in an executive leadership position in an organization, you may be in multiple. <laughs> so many of us are. Uh, will you raise your hand if you're in an executive leadership position? Great. Cool. Um, if you're in a middle management position in an organization, will you raise your hand? We love the kind of. That's very, <laughs> very familiar <laughs> to us. It's like a little bit of everything. 
Um, if you're like frontline or program staff, please raise your hand. Oh yeah, we have to call all Absolutely. Um, if you're an artist. Great. Um, and if you're someone who's uh, an admin worker, but maybe on more of a, like, a floating contract basis, maybe you're like a producer or a production manager or something like that, raise your hand. That applies to you. Great. If you've never been at anyone's org chart. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I'm here. It's, it's, it's I every, have work. Yeah, every time you went to an <laughs> HR meeting, everyone was confused. So nice to acknowledge we have a bunch of different uh, perspectives that we're coming from, and many of us are like, I don't quite know. Maybe it's a little fuzzy, or maybe you're holding to multiple positions within organizations or different organizations. Um, and then who is in whichever organizations you're in already practicing some form of workplace democracy or shared leadership? I just want to check just to get even more specific. Raise your hand if you would say, like, definitely shared leadership, 100%. Great. And now workplace democracy. Can I start the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Perfect. This cool. is super, super helpful. OK. Great. Cool. Yes, Daniel. Hey. Um, yeah. Great. So this, we've got like one little bit more bit of like table setting before we dive in. I know this is a lot of us talking to you. It's going to be the most of that that we have throughout. Um, I just want to encourage folks, like, take a second, do what you need to do to, like, ground yourself, check in with your body. If you haven't had a chance to do that today, if you want to close your eyes, if you want to just soften your gaze, take a breath, or if you want to be like, no, actually, my body doesn't want to check in right now, that's super fun, too, however it works for you. All right, what comes up in your body as you think about work? your workplace, the systems and the culture that we live in that inform what work even means, what it means to have a job, how we relate to one another, how power, formal and informal, informs how we work together and relate to one another. Just notice what comes up in your body. If that's a like, oh, I love this breath. If it's a like, oh, that's super complicated, right? No judgment around any of that. It's all good. Is this discomfort that's just as valid as like love or discomfort or attraction or what have you? So feel free to keep checking in with your body, but I want to share just um, a little bit of framing about how, why we're sharing this information and how we think about it. So first is just that we believe that the ideas and tools that we're going to be sharing with you today can be useful in no matter what kind of workplace you are in, even if you're coming from a hierarchical institution uh, and you're not planning on changing that, we think that some of these ideas can still be implemented and hopefully be useful to you um, or to your friends or colleagues or whomever else. Um, that uh, we share this information really rooted in the fight for collective liberation of all people from all systems of oppression. We see democracy uh, and the idea of democracy as a day-to-day -day practice as like a critical tool and also a result of ultimately our liberation from a lot of these systems. Um, and that uh, um, when we say democracy, right, we're really talking about how are we all sharing power. Right? The idea of, like, it's been interesting being at this conference for me and hearing the term shared leadership a lot. Um, and so I just want to distinguish for us, like, leadership being a quality that everyone has. Everyone can step into leadership and has places where they can lead in their lives, period. Um, but power, right? Power meaning, like, the ability to make change, to do things, to get stuff done, right? To be a decision maker on certain things, right? We all have varying levels of that. But we, we want to talk about power as being something different from leadership. We want to uh, disambiguate this a little, bit, a little bit in our conversations today. Um, and so with all of that, while a lot of the tools that we're sharing can be used for essentially harm reduction in what can be like toxic workplaces, and that's great, we are sharing these tools from a place of, we, we believe that we need to radically re-envision what our ecosystem looks like, period, that we are so, thank you, um, steeped in you know, capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, ableism, et cetera, et cetera, right? That like, we are sharing this not because we're like, oh, we want 
philanthropy or whatever to be more democratic, we're sharing this in the spirit of we need these tools to figure out how we abolish philanthropy and make sure everybody's needs get met, for instance. Um, yeah. Uh, is there anything else? Yeah, uh, so I guess the last thing with all of that is ultimately um, democracy very much being like about people having a day-to-day -day say in all aspects of their lives and really focusing on like bodily autonomy as being a really important part of that. And so uh, we believe that by helping create a world where people have a direct say in the conditions of their lives and in their communities, right, like a real actual democratic say, we see this work even when we're just focusing on our workplaces, which like are a big part of where we spend our time, that if we can make our workplaces, our communities, our homes more democratic, right, we see that as, uh, we see that as being in solidarity with movements for liberation across the globe, um, and particularly today we want to lift up uh, the movement for the freedom and autonomy of the Palestinian people, right? We see ourselves very much in relationship to uh, that work and that movement, and even though in some ways we're talking about a very particular place where democracy can live in our lives, ultimately what's most important to us is how do we put these values into our whole society, into every aspect of how we create culture as artists particularly. So, last thing is um, a little bit of our agenda, but also just some framing kind of tenets. Like, what does workplace democracy even mean? What do we mean when we're talking about this? So our agenda today is kind of gonna go through these three main points. First is that a democratic workplace is one in which everyone has equal say in the collective workplace and autonomy over how their individual work gets done. Democratic management can be seen as a spectrum, and even hierarchical workplaces can utilize the tools for democratic management to create a healthier work environment. And a democratic workplace can look like many different things, ranging from a collective where everyone has equal power in all decisions, to a hierarchy where those at the top of the hierarchy are systemically accountable to those below them. So we'll dive more into each of these three points and kind of how they come to life as we go, but this is kind of the broad frame. So I know that was a lot of information. Any questions about any of that before we dive in? Anything that will help ground you? Or to clarify? Yeah. 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 Yeah
Um, so this comes later, but uh, yeah. what is the IRS classification? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to do, do, do you remember this? Do you want to say? It's a little more refined. This hasn't been the same for <laughs> like the last two months. Um, we uh, just last week got our business license as an LLC. Um, our tax classification is a subchapter T, which is a tax classification largely used for worker cooperatives that choose to be an LLC rather than a cooperative corporation. Um, hello. Um, feel free to grab one of the chairs. Yeah, so we, we talk about ourselves, so we're going to cooperative. We've been a uh, startup for like a good chunk of time. Uh, but yeah, like Kat was saying, we just finally are now like formally a cooperative. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll say we still, we are um, fiscally, we are a Model C fiscal sponsored project for the field also, um, and they pass through that money straight to our LLC. Got it, and sorry, just, just to put my pad on my head works, and budget wise, where are y'all at? Um, we are at uh, 250 to $300,000, yeah. And I just chimed in, because by, um, Peter Dicasta NYC is a 501c3. Mm -hmm. Um, there is, we've been learning models, um, this model of like worker self-directed nonprofit, which is the structure to change the bylaws so you can continue as a 501c3, but implement uh, workplace democracy. And we will talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. 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 Let's just see folks want to hear about the structure mm -hmm. stuff. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Any other clarifying grounding questions that would be useful for folks? Um, I know a few folks also joined late after this, so really quick, one more time, or if or anything came up for anyone else, any other um, access means for today that folks want to share out loud? I know we're masked, so probably speaking up um, for me. I'm hearing this talk right sometimes. The other thing that I'll share is, um, no, I said a uh, session is being recorded by Helen, so I'll say that again. It's happening. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Quick question. Um, are we uh, able to team up and master drink or? Yeah, if you want to do a sip and turn, that's okay. totally cool. Yeah, okay. thanks for checking in. I appreciate that. Yeah. Also, just if, if anyone has trouble seeing the screen, I know the screen outside is sort of a little tricky. Feel free to like shift your chairs around and move if you need. Um, feel like you can see. All right, let's dive in. Let's 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 freaking do it, y'all. Uh, okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna ask you to start by finding a partner. And now find another partner. And it can be a group of three, that's totally fine. But yeah, find another partner. Great, and now that you've got comfortable, find a third, find a different partner, a completely different partner. Are we staying with partner one? No, 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 different partner. Oh! I know, oh, right? I gotcha. <laughs> you were like, here's my friend. <laughs> questions with your partner. How are big decisions made in your workplace and who are the decision makers? And how are small decisions made in your workplace and who are the decision makers? And if you don't know what a big or small decision is, that's also a great conversation to have. Um, so we'll keep time for you. We'll let you know when you've got uh, half your time left and about a minute left. Thank you. 
have had experiences where like a decision might get made that affects our work greatly and we're like I don't know how that happened or why um, and some of the hope is by naming uh, what these types of decision making are um, we can uh, endeavor to be more transparent about how these decisions are being made um, yeah this is uh, this framework is from the management center um, my, one of my dirty secrets is I work as the operations manager and outside of that administratively I do a lot of producing work I am pretty terrible with project management tools. If anybody names an acronym to me, it takes a really long time for me to catch on. Definitions take a long time for my brain to kind of settle into. Um, so I just I just want to share that for folks who like whatever they receive tools are like, oh my god, but I've been doing this this one way and intuiting through feeling. Um, it, it like catching on to these things can sometimes take time, and it, it, it takes me a lot of time to. It takes me a lot of time to figure things out. Um, ah, uh, anyway. Um, so the different types of decision making that exist, and here you can see there's a spectrum from more democratic to less democratic, but these decisions can take place kind of anywhere. Um, is the first one is joint. Um, this is when a team is making a decision usually via voting and often through um, consensus or consent. Um, I think an example for this for obvious agency, uh, we make our budgeting uh, joint, uh, the final confirmation of our budget is a joint decision. Usually I will build out our budget at the top of every fiscal year, um, and uh, after, a few round, after a few rounds of edits and things like that, we'll finally take it to a vote to figure out if that is the budget that we wanna be working with. Um, the second one is consulting. Um, this is when the decision makers are seeking input that will actively inform the final decision that is made. So the decision, there, there is a set group of people making that decision, um, but they're actively seeking input from the rest of the group to change that decision. So an example that I can give is, um, I was working um, for the Bearded Ladies um, a few years ago in the middle of the pandemic, um, creating an outdoor performance festival using a uh, using a kind of a truck that is a mobile performance unit that kind of drives around the city. Um, about two weeks before um, this festival kicked off, which had about 16 different partners, 16 different locations, 16 different shows that we kind of all made, there was a big COVID spike in 2021. Um, we realized for that, uh, for our organization, the decision makers on whether what we were going to do um, in the order to keep our audiences and artists safe, the final decision was for myself, the production manager and the artistic director to me, make, but we didn't want to do that just with the three of us, so we held probably a like two hour meeting with the rest of the Beard staff um, and had a really long conversation about what are all, what are the options that we see, what, how are people feeling about performing, um, as numbers are spiking. Um, yeah. Welcome. Uh, welcome, hello. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. How how are folks feeling as the numbers are spiking and uh, kind of took a lot of temperature of the room before coming back to the final decision? Um, so that moment was a moment of consulting. Um, test. Consult, test, and persuade are something that I get mixed up all the time. Um, so for me, it took time to figure this out. Um, test is when a decision maker have have an idea or ideas that they and they want to see how this holds up. Um, this often looks like bringing a ton of options to this table and asking for feedback on like what option feels best. Um, so an example, we were deciding our fiscal sponsor a month ago. <laughs> um, we were deciding our fiscal sponsor a month ago, um, and I kind of came to the group several times with um, lists of like, first, do we want to be a Model C or a Model A fiscal sponsor? Um, yeah, there, which are different amount, yeah, for some of the, uh, yeah, which are different um, structures for fiscal sponsorship. Here are the different options for fiscal sponsorship that exist. So coming to the table with options and then seeing what option kind of works best for folks. Um, the next one is persuade, which is when a decision maker has an idea and wants to build by it. Um, I was once working at a company with a pretty small staff um, where the artistic director was like, we're gonna do two major shows in the Philadelphia Fringe Festival, two um, curated shows that are expected to bring in, like their same budget size, are expected to bring in the same audience, um, and was like, I need to test if next, or I need to, sorry, persuade yeah. the staff that we can do two shows at the same time. <laughs> um, I will ultimately be the decision maker on this, but I need to persuade the staff that we have capacity. Um, so again, we had a long, like, Two hour meeting of getting of getting staff input as to like whether or not this is a good idea and the um, artistic director ultimately um, trying to be like I know I want this in my soul but I don't know if anybody wants to do it <laughs> um, and then the final thing is tell so this is when the decision makers have made their decision and want to promote understanding and work towards implementation uh, this is where the decision maker just tells you what happened. Um, so these can be as small things as I bought bagels and brought them into the break room for us to eat this morning, to as big as, hey, so yesterday our board told us to furlough all the staff for the pandemic except for contractors, and then you can do pro, but the contractors should keep programs going. That totally didn't happen to me in 2020. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Um, so like, where on the spectrum does it exist when folks don't know how much to say they have. For example, I often um, write up proposals and it goes to the leadership meeting, but I don't go to the leadership meeting, so I don't know exactly how much sway it might have. You know, it's the same thing, you know, you yeah. send an email, but then you get a response and you're like, I don't think they read the email. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, where would you say that lands on the spectrum of, I might have a say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, and Daniel, feel free to jump in here, but I, for me, I see that and I'm like, oh, well, it seems like you don't know if you're the decision maker or not, so these are articulated from the perspective of who the decision maker is, and that feels like the conversation is like, am I, am I making the decision in this moment, or are you, or are we? Yeah. Um, which, it, yeah, which is something I think, uh, outside of obvious agency, I've been through with a lot of workplaces, uh, where I will write proposals, and then they're like, I don't, and, and like, usually follow up with work, with like, my, with folks being like, who's deciding this? Because I would, I think it really falls under my job description, um, but yeah. Yeah, I would say uh, it doesn't, and that's exactly why a tool like this is important, right? What I'm hearing you say is, I put together a proposal, I don't know what happened to, like I gave it to somebody and then something happened maybe, but I'm not totally sure, right? To me, what I hear in that is, there's actually a very unclear decision process that's going on. You know, okay, I, I can submit a proposal, so that part at least is clear. Ideas can come from across the staff, but who is responsible for taking that idea? Who is responsible for deciding whether that gets talked about or not? Who is responsible for actually making a decision if it does get talked about? And who's responsible for following up with you to say, hey, here's what happened in that conversation, right? I think that's part of the frustration that a tool like this is meant to help uh, address and really this is just the first step of that process which is saying like okay for the people making decisions for any given decision a big one or a small one 
can I be clear with the other people involved that yeah, actually I'm just making this decision and I'm just gonna tell you what the result is. Or actually, we wanna be fully joined on this. I, I Maybe I have some thoughts, but I wanna hear, like I want you all to be part of that process with me. Or it's somewhere in the middle of like, hey, so ultimately I'm gonna make this decision, but I really want your input on this. It's gonna be critical, but I am the one who is ultimately gonna say we go with option A, option B, yes or no, but I'm really gonna to listen to what you have to say, so let's figure out how we get your input on it. Um, so it doesn't fall on the spectrum. It's what this spectrum is for. Yeah. Uh, can I also just ask a clarifying question or sort of observation of that example, which is, um, in that example that you gave of a proposal, my question is also, yeah. like, what is that thing, right? How did a proposal come about? Mm -hmm. You can apply this whole model to that. Yeah. Like, was there input? Who is feeding into it? Mm -hmm. What is a proposal for? So, like, it feels like, in the example you gave, where is it in process? Yeah. And who is part of that process? As opposed to, is it a, a decision that just gets a thumbs up, thumbs down, and from who, right? But I, I'm sure there's more details yeah, in there, but it feels like there's some sort of feedback mm -hmm. in that example. Yeah. yeah, I think I've definitely, yeah, I, I think you, yeah, that feels really right on. I've definitely had a lot of it. I, I feel a lot of experiences where, like, often when people are unclear about the decisions that they want to make, um, a way of deferring being clear about this decision is being like, hey, can we get a proposal for you, from you, and before we know actually who has the power in making that decision or when. Um, yeah, I note that that's often a feedback loop that when I was working kind of in middle, uh, yeah, as like program staff for places, um, before people knew how they wanted to make that decision, they were like, I just need a proposal from everything for you, and I'm like, well, cool, but this is, I don't know what I'm writing towards, yeah. And I think like you're pointing out, something that uh, I think we think is really interesting about this spectrum, right, is that it is exactly like you're saying. If you look at it, it's also kind of the process of how a decision gets made, ultimately, right? Like it doesn't have to start out with joint, but it's like, okay, cool. Whoever the decision makers are, start thinking, okay, we need to make a decision. What's going to inform that? Consult is like, okay, well, whose input do we need to gather? Maybe it's just mine. Maybe it's mine and some other people, right? testing out some options, okay, uh, how do I feel, option A, option B, okay, there's other people who like need to buy in on this, so I'm gonna try to persuade them, and then ultimately everybody else just gets told, okay, cool, right? So like, there is a way in which this is both a framework for articulating how are we making the decision, while also being like, this is kind of just how the decision-making process goes, even if it's just one person doing it all internally for themselves. Can I have a question? Yeah. Um, so the first example you gave on joint, uh, in terms of, okay, we have the, the, all the information has been gathered, we take a vote, I want to go back to the question of democratic leadership. Is, it, is that vote a majority vote, mm -hmm. democratic, or is it a consensus? It's like we all have to agree on what this budget is, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's been an iterative process. Yeah, yeah, for obvious agency, we do a consensus vote on our budget and most of our major decisions. So. Uh, for, for us most recently, that's looked like our budget, uh, what we want our business entity status to look like, who we are choosing as our fiscal sponsor. Um, also like the programming that we are doing for this season. Um, we have, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more as we get into organizational structure, um, but we have a general, we have a general circle where all of our worker owners meet um, that is voted on and we are doing it in our artistic processes as well for Space Opera, Sulu is a part of our executive circle for that, so we had to have a consensus vote for our project budget with um, the staff members um, and artists who are working on that project as well. Yeah. How many worker owners just so I can... Um, we've got four worker owners, um, and then for Space Opera, uh, we have a staff of about 14 to 15, um, and a five to six person general circle. Good. Yeah. I just wanted to sh share um, that this spectrum, more democratic to less democratic, what's been interesting to me in engaging it has been also processing that it is not a spectrum of good and bad. Mm -hmm. yep. And it is not a spectrum of feels nice, it feels icky. Yeah. Like, 
there are definitely been times where like figuring out being able to say to each other, just tell me what to do, this felt great. And like telling, and I think this was reflected in a, in a session yesterday on passing the torch, constantly consulting people in some ways does not always feel great for everybody. So just to kind of like break attachment to like thinking we will be better the more democratic we are in every decision. It's like, it's, it's, we're humans. We need different um, scales of, of when it happens when. Um, and relationally, we might need different things. Absolutely. Why don't we keep moving into yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, I think that was a, I, was, I was on the same page. Because what we're going to move into is uh, reflecting a little bit on how we see these things show up in our organizations. Um, so we're going to do this uh, with a, a spatial facilitation exercise, moving our bodies around the room to uh, uh, indicate to the group where we're seeing these things show up. Uh, I want to underline what Sue has said again, right? Like, this is not a scale of good to bad. Like, we are advocating for workplace democracy. We do not make all of our decisions by jointly, right? Like, we would literally never get anything done if that was the case. Uh, right? We have roles that are assigned for people are like, you have the power to just tell us what we need to do, right? You need to bring the materials for this program, and you are going to bring post-its. I am telling you, and you are doing that. And if that was a joint decision, it would be very silly. Uh, so I just want to say that right, none of this is pejorative, and it's small exploration and a discovery of like what you were finding in your organizations, and what and what might it feel like to change? Right? What, what do we? Uh, what might we need? What are the things that are in our way? Um, so I'm just kicking things over because I'm very graceful. I'm a dancer. Can you tell? <laughs> um, okay. So what we're going to do? Um, uh, I'm going to clear a little bit of space for us here. We're going to use this space right here behind the chair. Yeah, you want to give me a scene to it? Um, so what I'm going to ask folks to do is we are going to use this space here behind the chair. Let's do it on this side, this is how it's already doing. So this is going to be joint. And this side is going to be tell. So we can imagine, right, somewhere on the spectrum, we have joint, consult, test, persuade, and tell. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to arrange yourself along the spectrum according to how the majority of decisions get made at your organization. Right? So if you're like, we're a small group of working consensus for everything, maybe you're on this side. If you're like, the boss just tells everyone what to do, maybe you're on that. Again, this might be complicated. Yeah. Okay, right, so you're joint over here. Wait, sorry, which one is joint? Joint over here. Tell is over here. Great. Cool. And take a look around. See the distribution that you have in the room. And if you're like, oh, maybe you have a feeling you're like unsure, if anyone wants to move to another spot, feel free to keep feeling that out as you keep talking about things. <laughs> Absolutely, right? <laughs> this, I, I just want to raise this up, right? The like, <laughs> the like, oh, I'm not sure, so that's here. Like, this is really real, and I love seeing that's part of the point of this tool, right? To be able to see that kind of expression of I'm not, I'm not sure, right? Different types of decisions can happen there. Um, so I actually want to start by I'm going to ask some folks to just tell us a little bit about where you placed yourself where you were. Um, David, may I start with you? Can you tell me a little bit about this placement? Sure. Um, we have a fairly, my organization is called Building for the Arts. Mm -hmm. We Our main program is Theater Row, uh, and it's fairly hierarchical uh, on paper and structure. But the style of working and the diversity of programs expertise of the disciplines within there um, means that the leadership team really depends, I depend on their expertise in their areas, and they depend on the expertise of their team members, and so there is a lot of testing. Um, so yeah, we're somewhere in this, in the range between persuade and consult based on whatever it is. Totally. Yeah, I want to lift up that. Uh, right, the part of what I'm hearing is there's a pretty hierarchical structure, right? But then people are working, it's not like people are working well with each other. 
right? There's like a trust built expertise shared inside of there. I think this is very common for, especially like outside of obvious agency, but like more nonprofit spaces I've been in. I've seen a lot of like this kind of place of like these structures aren't in place, but people are sort of like flexing within them and communicating well. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, can someone over on this side uh, tell me a little bit about why you place yourself on this side? Uh, I can go. I'm from Crowded uh, Fire, and Ooh. we have <laughs> we have a five person change leadership team, which makes up um, the the vast majority of our staff, um, Julie's with me as well. Um, and so we make a lot of decisions jointly through consensus and consent. Um, and uh, um, I think we're like, in some ways, finding ways to add more consulting and testing and figuring out like what the spectrum, what spectrum feels good um, to everyone uh, and gaining more clarity around roles and responsibilities. But for my position specifically, I, I share a lot of decisions, and so um, and there's a lot of a uh, lot of overlap. So joint to consult folks. Great. Totally great. Get credit of fire. Also, we went to Caro recently. So oh my God. Cool. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, 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 as well as stuff from what you were saying, I was hearing like a lot of it is really joint, and you're like, okay, sometimes maybe we actually want to make something test or persuade or something further towards this end of the spectrum. Does that sound correct? And, and if I may add, I think Naila and I hold different functions at Credit Fire, right? Like Naila is holding more artistic and producing tasks. I sit more on the management and operation side of things. Mm -hmm. So I actually deliberately put myself a touch more towards consult because I will be bringing a lot of conversations to my team, to other stakeholders, to the board um, for administrative and operations decisions that I do sometimes ultimately make or make a case for in a way that's a little different from artistic decision making, I would say. That's cool. I also just love seeing, right, like even within an organization, like these perceptions from happening can be a little different. It's really interesting. Thank you. Um, anyone who's like more on this side towards uh, tell, will you tell us a little bit about why you place yourself here? We're a uh, company one theater. Um, we're uh, 25 years old right now. Um, when we started, we actually started from that end of the spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. before, before workers comp, our uh, workers cooperative was yeah. used a lot more actively. It was founded uh, by six founders and then four, mm -hmm. and it was entirely a consensus based uh, mm -hmm. decision. Uh, not even democratic, it was consensus. Um, so, a lot of the work that we did. Uh, uh, like I remember, we used to have like six, eight-hour staff meetings <laughs> just to get to a space of consensus. Um, and uh, as they grew, uh, and when I plugged in, but maybe through an executive leadership, um, there were aspects of it still. But as the organization scaled um, and workers grew, we started moving away from what I would consider a workplace democracy to a shared leadership. Um, and specifically for us, we doubled in scale from before the pandemic to the after, so we were like 750, 800 to 1.6. Uh, and what's been fascinating, and which is why I'm in hell, is we need to find our way back to that culture uh, that the organization scale, and the organization scale in the context of fundraising, because you needed to move to a tell space to gather resources to meet all the growing demands on the expense side. Um, but culture hasn't caught up yet. Um, so part of what we're at is, I think, figuring out, OK, how do you go back? I don't know if I'll ever go back to that end of the spectrum. But do you move? Um, and how do you like scale back and forth, and how do you tier that within the organization? I think just, yeah. That's really interesting. I just wanted to see uh, from either organizations or inner that you know about. Uh, I, I feel like I was like, oh yeah, the, the pathway of like a like collective or a small group of founders that then whose budget size grows and you end up more on this side. Is anyone like, oh yeah, that looks familiar? I see Sulu over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing, and I think that we think a lot about in terms of like. Right, size and growth, and what does that mean for scale? Uh, this actually leads really well to the next question I want to ask. I think I just want to follow up because you sort of uh, primed it exactly. Is um, what do you think your organization would need, or what are the things blocking you from 
figuring out something that's a little bit more towards the choice. Yeah. Sorry, you might be the first part. Yeah, what absolutely. Uh, what do you feel like is blocking you or that you would need to move towards some more democratic participation in the organization? So in a 501c3, I think it's, um, like I think about it in the context of both revenue and uh, expenses as a diplomatic director, the expense is moving to a space where it's actual, you're like moving further along the spectrum. It's just a matter of time um, to get there. Like we like not to do it, we just move away from it and we'll go back to it. So the idea of creating a budget, for instance, that uh, has like can be even like consensus. I think we can get to. It's the revenue side of it that is like not even in the organization, like even in leadership, that's not in my control because I'm going into a board and really funders and individual donors. Like there's reliance in, I think, concepts of earned income and solidarity upon me absolutely. But when you're 1.6 and when you're doing equity based work like we are, where we do free production and free credit, earned income and solidarity economy will get us up to a point. Mm -hmm. But it is really my philanthropy, white donors, white board mm -hmm. members that can make the dynamics of the organization work. Mm -hmm. um, so for us to move more in that direction, it's really how do you divest from white wealth um, to be able to move in that? Because in some ways, do you really want to be a democratic-based organization with like black leadership, indigenous leadership, disabled leadership, and put them in conversation with like wealth and white funders? Because that's an easy problematic space. Or do you exist in a slightly more complicated space? Do they want to be in that space? Right? Like yeah. those are the questions we're grappling with. Yeah. And like that, so, so to me, that divestment from white wealth. Yeah. We can figure that out. Yeah. I see us moving further down the path. Absolutely. Just a, a simple thing, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. thing, but or like, the, I mean, I just yeah, like yeah, having some similar dynamic. Yeah. Like, but also I just like the, the thing is like to, to Daniel's point very earlier, like the white wealth is like the controlled by the like by white supremacist structures, but it isn't actually theirs, right? So if we just had it, like, yeah, this one, so, like that, that's where I get caught up. It's just like, oh, that's frustrating. Like, that's the path, which it, it really is ours. So how do we break it from this other? Yeah. I, we have one more direct response here. Yeah. Well, I do reflections from what I'm hearing around me and what brought me to this room. You mentioned time in a totally different context, but I think about time as a resource and how that impacts where we can exist on mm -hmm. this spectrum. and. Um, and how active decision making about scale can free up time to um, change our location on the spectrum. And I'm also thinking a lot about communication and how um, how knowing to that earth point, like knowing how decisions are getting made, uh -huh. is such an important ingredient in this. We're having a situation. I'm, I'm a better average board leader. We have a hierarchical structure, and then we have a non-hierarchical. Staff, staff group that I'm part of, so I'm interested in any section, but um, they're like clamoring for an org chart. <laughs> executive leadership, it's like it's like the biggest kept secret, right? Like this executive leadership wow. for, a variety, for a variety of reasons, all, and some of them very good reasons, um, are reluctant to share with the organization. But I actually find myself in this, in this conversation wondering, are people looking for the hierarchy or are they looking for the decision making system right. to know who is accountable right. and who and who they need to um, look to for the answers that they are seeking? So a little different than the conversation, but two things that were coming in my brain. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna move. I'm seeing your question there, yeah. and for time I'm gonna move us on. But hold yeah. on to your question because we'll have Q and A time. Um, yeah, just want to say, right, and like part of the thing is like that lack of transparency means you don't know, right? You don't know what people are needing because you don't know what's happening. And so it keeps you need, like, even being able to like, be like, are we on the same side about why we want this thing? Um, these are really like robust and good questions. We are going to have time, especially at the end for Q&A and also get into some case studies of specific organizations that have implemented these things. So just want to flag that 
we're now leaving these questions, there's going to be more time to get into these. I want to hold on to them. Um, thank you all. Uh, I think we can return to our seats, and uh, I will move into the next session.
we spending if we have the money to spend? The workers deciding how are we going to spend this money to our benefit, right? Do we want travel stipends? Do we want health insurance, right? Even if it's not full coverage, do we want to increase the amount of coverage that we get? Is your 990 a reflection on how you prioritize people or how you prioritize products? Right, yeah, what is the budget sharing? And it's interesting, right, as we're talking, these things are all interconnected too, right? Like, if you have, like, pay transparency, right, or if you know what salary bands are, you have more information to then see what salaries are and work horizon around that, which affects money. Same with, like, how power is shared to make those decisions around money, um, and, like, how people are cared for as well. Um, we're going to do breakout groups. So we're going to tell you what they are, and then we're going to like have a moment to sort of figure out what's the best way for us to do these in the space that we have, or if we want to spread out outside the room. Um, so the three uh, groups that we're going to do, we're going to have one on power, which is going to be activity around a decision-making matrix, which Pat is going to be leading. Uh, we have one on information, which is going to be around open bookkeeping, which will be led by Daniel. And then we have one on people, which will be led by me, which is about a 360 degree uh, group evaluation and self evaluations in the workplace. Um, so uh, let me say really quick, just yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah, more, yeah. just to clarify what that means so people have a better. So uh, the decision making matrix for power is specifically about that question of like, how do we make it clear who is what, making what decisions how, and how those decisions are getting made? It's a tool specifically for articulating that. Um, open bookkeeping is a practice of sharing that financial information across the staff of the organization um, and in order to build a stronger sense of buy-in with that and also how do you teach staff to read a budget if they don't know how because how can you make decisions about money if you don't actually know how to understand how that money is moving. Um, I know I've been there. Um, and then for the uh, people, the 360 degree evaluations, this is essentially a, a tool for how do we evaluate one another as peers who are trying to work together, as opposed to saying, you are my boss and you are only evaluating me, right? Well, how does that boss receive feedback on how they're doing as a supervisor, for instance? Um, so it's about, yeah, flattening that structure. Um, like, essentially, my all right, welcome back, y'all. Um, if you are eating in here because we're a small group, I think that's real. Uh, I'm just going to ask, but yeah, just maintain six feet of distance. Let's try to be as safe as we can be while refueling ourselves. Um, yeah, feel free to sit wherever you want. We're going to move into case studies next, um, but a quick question just for time. So, uh, we so we kind of have two options in terms of, I know people were really interested in the like, okay, how do you implement this? What does it look like in practice? Obviously the tools get us to a little bit of that. But so um, I have a question. I can either talk to you all about like, theoretically broadly, like what would a democratic nonprofit look like? How is it structured? What is that org chart? And what are people's like jobs within that? And what is it like, like to be a worker day to day within that? Right, that's kind of theoretical and broad. We can talk a little bit about executive leadership, or we can talk more specifically about some case studies of how people are using democratic management to do things like season planning, to uh, share power with contract staff. Um, of those two, are you more interested in the kind of like broad theoretical, this is what it looks like for a workplace as a whole? Raise your hand. Okay, great. <laughs> and then I really want to hear about the specifics of like how some people have done this in practice for certain decisions. Okay, great. We'll focus there. Um, there's plenty more time. We're around. You can talk to us, and I'll talk more about that at the end. Um, okay, beautiful. So, uh, yeah, let's start here. Let's start by talking about the FLED. Um, so, uh, with the FLEB, what we're going to talk about is how they did their season planning. For those that are unfamiliar, the FLEB was a group that spawned out of the FLEA. Um, they were a collection of many of the, um, uh, I don't even know, remember exactly what their sort of titles were, but basically a lot of the like performers and designers and whatever that went kind of flew through the FLEB's kind of pipelines of like professionalization and like early career artists. And we're like, hey, it's really not cool that like we don't get paid for this work or we don't get paid well for this work, and et cetera, et cetera. And so there was this whole, there was lots of drama. It was very public. And then these folks were like, we're going to go off and do our own thing. Um, so they did season planning with a membership of 100 people. 
So what I will never hear again is an artistic director being like, I can't involve everyone in this process. It doesn't make any sense. Um, because there are ways to do it, right? It takes some creativity to figure out how to do it, and it certainly takes time, but it is indeed possible. Um, yeah, so the FLED, they shared all this information with me. Do you mind just putting your mask back on? Thank you, appreciate it. It's all good, it just happened. Um, so, uh, this is how they did it. First was, they had an artistic committee uh, from their membership, right? So these were folks who voluntarily chose to step into a leadership role. For you, if you're at like a regional theater, for instance, this might just be your artistic department. And the artistic committee was tasked with basically building the structure for like, okay, well, how are we gonna do this democratically? What is this actual process? For eggs, so right, for art designing and architecting that process and then implementing it. Um, and then, right, exactly. So the way that they did that in their first year of doing this was that they had essentially figured out, okay, there's three tiers of slots. There's like the high key projects that take a lot of energy, effort, resource to make happen. There's the like low key slots that are like not that big of a deal. And then there's the like even lower of key slots where it's like we're not that big thing. And so they were like, okay, we've got like space for like one high key project, three low key projects, and like a handful of others at that sort of lowest denominator, right? Then individual members were invited to propose projects to the group from, and, and, and to assign it to one of those categories. We think this is high key, we think this is low key, whatever. Um, they just did that by a Google form. And then of course, kind of grassroots organizer style, there's a lot of like individual outreach to be like, hey, I've heard you had a really good idea, or you've been talking about this project for a really long time, or you're just really creative, we think that you should submit something, right? So activating the membership and really inviting them into the process. The artistic committee then reviewed all the proposals and just assigned them to tiers. There was no process of elimination. All the proposals were going to everybody. The artistic committee just like collated all of the data and information into something that was legible. And they said, okay, yes, this you assigned it to the right tier or actually we know what this is gonna take a little bit better maybe than you do. We're gonna assign this to a different tier. And then they had a pitch party. I love that they did it as a party. I think that's really lovely. They did it hybrid in order to make it accessible to folks. Um, but basically, uh, everyone who proposed a project had a little time slot to pitch the project to the full group. Everyone had an info packet with all of the information on all of the projects. And then at the end of the evening, after all of the pitches had happened, uh, they used rate choice voting uh, as their form of democratic practice, right? And so people voted on basically three ballots, uh, of, uh, yeah, th uh, three tier ballots, right? So one for the high key projects, the low key projects, and the lower than low key projects. And so then ultimately the result of each of those elections through that ranked choice voting landed that, okay, this is our season for this year. So that's how they did it in their first year. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. <laughs> So uh, part of what they found as they were telling me about this is that um, a big reason that they needed to make a change in the process was that they needed the, um, they needed the artistic planning process to be in better alignment with the operations planning process. Right, kind of important. Um, so the first steps of the process were about the same. They still had the artistic committee building and administering the process. They had individual members proposing projects. But then the artistic committee took a stronger leadership role here, right? They stepped up and they claimed more power. And instead what they did was they reviewed all of the proposals. They administered formal and informal uh, polls across membership to gather input from them. So testing, right? Do you like this idea better or do you like this idea better? Or sometimes consulting. Uh, what do you think is most important for us for our upcoming season, right? What are the values or ideas that should be pushing us forward? Uh, and then they created actually a season proposal for the group, right? So it's not, okay, there's all these tiers and you're running on all these projects. It's, we think our season should be this. Like, here's our reason why. And then the members voted yes or no on that final season proposal. Um, one clear critique I've heard of this issue and that I've also experienced in other group processes is just that that artistic committee as um, folks who were both used to being kept from power and were invited in for the first time and actually held a lot of power, um, 
they were really, really concerned with like, but do we really represent like the group's desires and the group's interests, right? There's this fear of like, are we really the right people to make this decision ultimately? As opposed to really accepting and taking in, we've been given the choice, the power, it's been delegated to us to decide how we want to do this. People are saying they trust us so we can do it. So they did like one formal poll is what I heard, but then they kept doing all of these like informal, like, oh, we just want to check in or we just want to hear what you think about this or da, 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 right? Which isn't bad necessarily, but again, there's just this, um, I think there's an important thing to lift up here around how right democracy is a living process that you're constantly going through. It needs constant iteration. Um, and it can be hard for people who are not used to holding positions of power to hold those positions of power, even when the group has all said, we want you to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at our place of work, we tried doing something similar mm -hmm. um, with staff who usually don't have much decision-making power, if any, were invited to be on the associate committee. But then we were told, oh, actually, because you're staff, you shouldn't be really talking that much in these conversations. You should just be listening. Mm -hmm. And we found that even though we saw this as not Right. Like so the production manager suddenly my uh, well not suddenly there were reasons this happened but then my schedule was changed to the night meeting to go to the artistic committee to those artistic committee meetings yeah. at all anymore yeah. Yeah. and that happened to the the rest of our staff too yeah. so even though like this could have been the opportunity to have those with the least amount of power but are doing a lot of work for the organization being a part of that right. committee instead of the prioritization was the people who um, are our audience. Not to say we shouldn't also be on the artistic committee. They definitely should be. But I don't know. Have, did you, was there any, I don't know if you know the details of this case study, but were there points from people who were going to be on the artistic committee who were intentionally or unintentionally then pushed out of it? Um, my understanding is generally no. I mean, their structure is also very different where uh, it's, they're, they're, uh, they're not a volunteer run organization, but they're not sort of formally paid either. They had a pot of money that they were pulling from, but this wasn't like anybody's full-time job or even part-time job that they were doing really. Um, but I think to your point, right, part of it, there's a couple of different challenges there. The first one, right, is clearly how decisions were getting made and expectations of inviting new people into that process were not explained clearly up front. It sounds like you went into that, pro or there at least there was miscommunication, right? It sounds like you went into that process feeling like, I, I'm gonna get to, like, I'm gonna have a say, I'm gonna have a vote, like, I'm allowed to participate in this. And your, that was your expectation. And then actually it was like, no, 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 our intention was we want you, or, or what happened was we want you to listen a little bit more than actually participate in the conversation, right? So there was a miscommunication there of how are we actually making, what is this decision-making process actually going to be, right? The second part is a really critical thing for anyone who's considering moving to democratic management is like one of the uh, drawbacks of democratic management stuff is it does take more time, right? It's very group process focused, whereas hierarchy allows for very fast decision making to happen, right? Uh, as we're saying, right? One is not necessarily better than the other between uh, democratic management or horizontal structures or hierarchy. They just have their different advantages and drawbacks. Um, but so, you have to like work plan for folks to make sure like, do you have the time in your schedule and the capacity to be participating in this? And if not, and if we're really invested in it, what needs to get taken off your plate? What can we not do? What needs to shift so that you can show up just from like a, from a scheduling point of view, from a like, I'm not deprioritizing this work because there's more important stuff that like needs to happen, right? That gets in the way all the time. Uh, I know for me and my work. Um, yeah, so planning is another critical part of this, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna keep us moving on to our next case study and then we'll have a whole long section for the q and So Space Opera, like we talked about, this is a project that we're working on. We're always iterating with new ways of sharing power with contract staff particularly, right? Recognizing that artists and contract workers broadly are the least protected class of worker uh, in the US. And so we're trying to figure out how can we rectify some of that, recognizing that it's a deeper systemic issue that needs to be addressed through a collective governance and not just one workplace. Um, but so for space opera, you can essentially imagine it as one big circle in the middle called the executive circle, and then a bunch of smaller circles shooting out of that. And they're essentially just departments. 
projects, right? And you can almost think of the executive circle as like the board for the production. So we have the theatrical circle, which is like Kev, the director, the performer facilitators, Joe and Sulu, designers, the stage manager. I was part of the uh, mechanic circle, which is where all the game designers were positioned. Uh, we have a production administration circle, which is where like production management and like assistants supporting the administration live. Um, and then we had a hospitality circle who was thinking about like care for both our team, right? So company management kind of stuff, but then also care for the audience, right? So front of house, box office, community engagement, et cetera, et cetera. Each of those circles gets to autonomously decide how they work and how they make decisions. So if, for instance, we were open from the beginning to the theatrical circle could say at any point, we just want to work totally traditionally and hierarchically. We want the director to make all of the calls. Uh, the designers will have like very specific uh, work areas that they're working on. The performer facilitators will like devise and contribute, but they're not necessarily making any decisions, right? We said, you could do that. You all get to decide how you make decisions. Or you could work totally flat if you want to and do something a little bit different there. And again, we can talk a little bit more if you have questions about what does this look like in practice. Kat can speak to a lot of that as the director. Um, and so that each circle elects a representative to the executive circle, right? So you have these four external circles feeding into the executive circle. The way that we did this was that um, every circle, for every four members that they have, they get one representative in the circle. So for instance, the theatrical circle had something like eight members, so they got two reps. And then all of a sudden, we hired a third, another person into that circle, a ninth person, so they got a third representative in that circle, in the executive circle. The producer, obvious agency, got one representative in the executive circle as well to make sure the producer's voice, who's ultimately taking on the most risk with the project, is there in that room making decisions, right? Um, and then myself as the lead artist uh, also got a seat in that circle to help make sure that the project is staying kind of broadly in alignment with my original vision when I was proposing the project to the group. Um, and, and really importantly, like we're talking about, right, staff plans and all that, when we're working with contractors, we wanna make sure that we're compensating them for all of this time that they're putting into the work as well, so making sure that we're budgeting for that. So then the executive circle, we decided we wanna use consensus to make major decisions, right? We all want to agree. So we've got these representatives uh, from across the project and varying levels of like traditional power, right? So we've got designers in this group, we've got uh, uh, performers in this group, using consensus to make decisions about what is the project budget? Where should we be spending our money? Uh, what should the creative process be? informed by the amount of money that we have available to us, right? What are the contract terms that folks want to be working under, right? What's important to you there? And if there are major conflicts that uh, individual circles might choose, to, might need to work through, but they can't for whatever reason, the executive circle are the ones who ultimately negotiate that and figure it out, um, if needed. But we haven't really had a moment of that yet, I don't think. Um, so really this is a way uh, for us as the producer to share more power with the group while ultimately recognizing none of this is legally or contractually obligated at any point, right? This is kind of a little bit of what's fucked up, right? But we as the producer at any point could pull the plug on this structure and say, nope, we're making all the decisions and if you don't like that, we're gonna fire you. Mm -hmm. Right, so that power structure is still there underlying everything. Mm -hmm. But we are able to see in really meaningful ways um, how working in this way is impacting artists, right? And we see it both as like a tool for like, yeah, we just wanna treat workers better, but it's also a form of political education for the artists that we're working with to be like, you are part of the labor movement and you should really care about these things, even when you don't have as much power as you do. Um, so, right, these are some quotes from our staff. Uh, working with obvious agency is category categorically different from working with other workplaces in the sector because they structurally empower you as a co-creator and a collaborator. While many other groups employ top-down decision-making practices that leave designers feeling only responsible for narrow corners of the artistic process, uh, obvious agency's bottom-up circles model empowers all members of the creative team to articulate broad and bold visions about the entire scope of the project while also respecting individual team members' skills and expertise. The result is a project grand in scope with a full team of creators who are all deeply invested in the artistic outcome. It's amazing. But right, the thing that I want to lift up there is it also makes the art better, mm -hmm. is what the artists are saying. Mm -hmm. 
It's a rare and beautiful gift to participate in a devising process that feels so equitable as QT BIPOC contributor. It's easy for me to trust that whatever I leverage for obvious agency, labor, creative energy, thought, partnership, relationships, and audience, it will be met with care, consideration, and compensation that I don't take lightly, right? And so we're talking here about like, this is the work of racial justice, this is the work of disability justice, this is the work of gender justice, right? By actually giving those people power to make decisions about their own working conditions and not just saying, we'll listen to you, but like, we're gonna make the decisions ultimately for you, right? Like, you know yourself best, bodily autonomy, make the decisions that work for you, and when there are conflicts, let's be in discussion and figure out how to work through this together, ideally to get everybody in on that. Um, yeah, so that's face off, bro. You wanna talk a little bit about, oh yeah. The last slide, can you, yeah. just for context, yes. can you talk about scale? Like what are the numbers of those circles? Yeah, totally. Um, relatively small, well, I don't know, big for a theatrical production in some ways. So the theatrical circle I think is around nine-ish people, something like that. Yeah. The mechanic circle is four. There's one person who overlaps between the two. The production administration circle, it's like never fully gotten off the ground. It's been like two-ish. We don't have a lot of money to, to buy that kind of help yet, unfortunately. Uh, and then the hospitality circle is three. Um, so I think ultimately the exact circle is something like three, four, five, six. Six, six or seven, I think, people total. Um, yeah. and, and he was like 14 or 15 at the largest. Yeah. And it's changed a little bit over development. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, the largest, the team was 15, and then I think we have hired, we, we have hired some contractors to help with electrics and carpentry and a few things as those have gone on, but they haven't been part of, a part of the circles. They are, they're just, they're hired on for pretty discreet amounts of time. It's like a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but the intention there is like, well, if you're working on this project for a really long time, it's been developed in development for multiple years, that gives you a lot of buy-in to like, what is that process like, versus like, if it's like a day kind of thing, like we were talking about in our group, right, it's sort of like, mm, it doesn't make sense to share that level of power if you're around for a day kind of thing. Yeah, that, that was my question, what is, what's your production timeline? Is it, yeah, this project has been in development for about three years okay. now, so a yeah. while. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, totally. Um, and right, and so this is very much like, this is a devised project generally, right? We're not working on like a regional theater schedule, but like for new work development or something like that. And I think there, there are, I'm, I have no doubt there are other creative ways for even like a regional, especially if you know a little bit more about your hiring sooner rather than later, that kind of thing, to like implement some of these ideas. Duration question: Have you tried this with other productions, and like how short have you gone? Like, what is what is the smallest amount? Of yeah, time? we haven't done this exact model. This is by far the most in depth that we've done with this. I would say uh, the closest other thing is, um, and we'll have this as a gift for you all. But we did a project called Care About Each Other package uh, a few years ago, where we worked with fifteen local artists, and um, it was it, the creatively the project was very much alike. We're gonna give you a quick workshop, and then you're gonna go and make something, and that's it. We're done here. But what we wanted to do with them was, um, part of the question of this project was, how can we as a company be generating more passive income for ourselves outside of performances? And also, the idea was this is a COVID economic recovery project as well. We wanna get money into the hands of artists. So what we did there was we came up with, okay, here's our proposal for a profit sharing model. And all of the artists, before we contracted with them, we were like, hey, here's what we're proposing, but we're gonna have a meeting before all the contracting happens to get your input to see how you feel about all of this. We only had like two or three people show up to that meeting. Um, most of them were like, no, broadly, this sounds actually totally fine to us. One person was like, how do grants or like other financial opportunities outside of sales of the product come into this, which was great for clarifying. Um, but then we ultimately ended up moving through that model. And we were really clear with folks, again, transparency about how you make decisions. What we said on that project was, uh, we are front, we as a company are fronting all of the money for this project. You as the staff of it are getting paid no matter what for your work. So because of that, we are ultimately going to be the ones who make the decision about the financial, the revenue model and the financial model for this project because we are taking on all of the risk here but we are going to take your input really seriously, and if there are major concerns or other ideas on how we do that, we will sincerely consider them before we move forward with the contracting. So. Um, this is partially space opera, but it's also mm -hmm. for obvious agency. Yeah. Um, for the worker owners, um, what is, um, like how many hours are y'all working? Like what is, 
like the annual quote unquote uh, income range, and also for artists, um, there is that, like, what is the scope of their contract uh, ultimately? Yeah. And sorry, my last question in that is for the work of owners and artists, how are y'all thinking about health insurance in that? Mm -hmm. um, if you have your financial plan, we love it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so we're getting money seriously for the first time, like now right. in the yeah. last year or so. Um, that started with a hundred and ten thousand grant from the William Penn Foundation to force space opera to develop it, uh, and then a one hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant from Mellon over two years. So that is just we're just about to run out of that. We're likely about to get it up from them to 350 over two years, uh, and some other money coming in, including new stuff. Um, so it's a little hard to answer in part because, like for us, we are the three paid staff of Obvious Agency. The fourth worker owner, Ari, um, is a little bit more complicated because they work at a university, so that adds some other legal requirements and job requirements to make it work there. Um, we are all working in the range of like 12 to 18 hours a week. Hour. 20 to 20. 20. Yeah, I think I probably do 20 to 22. Great, okay, uh, thank you. Um, and we're all paid at a rate, cur we're all contract staff, we should be W2, but because of how we've had to get here, we're currently contract staff. Uh, and I think we're all getting paid a rate of around, it's like 35 an hour-ish. It's 3401. There you go, 3401 <laughs> an hour. And right currently, we don't have any benefits or anything like that because we are contract staff. But now that we have this LLC and we are owners, we have to be W two. So everything is about to change, and we're learning a lot. Yeah, and, so and for uh, a contract artist, we pay twenty five an hour, and generally we do hourly for folks because so much labor is lost in the like for performers, the amount of time it takes to memorize their lines or whatever that kind of thing. We can't always stick with that. Sometimes we do a flat fee based on estimated hours. But generally, we aim for like, and that's particularly when money is tighter, but generally we aim for hourly fees. Yeah, and I would say for the space software model, particularly during our development periods, and as we're heading towards Premiere, likely this, uh, likely we'll, we'll change around the model a little bit. Um, uh, staff were paid uh, flat fees based off of an hourly rate for our in-person workshops, where we would have about two to three of those a year, and then in between that, um, in between that, staff who are not on our executive circle could invoice for up to 10 hours of prep work a month. Or if you were on our executive circle or in multiple circles, um, were able to invoice for up to 15. Yeah, and sorry, I asked that because I think what's cool about the trajectory of where you're heading is that like expansion of hours, like building up to really that full time model with the democracy structure from obvious agency to space opera. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a helpful thing. Yeah, sure. Um, I want to pass it over to Sue and now to talk a little bit about like the process of transitioning from a hierarchical model to a flatter model. Um, so yay! Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, like it's been helpful just in this dialogue today to realize like our journey isn't actually hierarchy to, mm. to this. Um, so theater via president NYC. Um, it's been baked into what we do, like the, the work is inspired by the work of Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and that is about the, the people experiencing the problem have to design the actions you know, to change the problems. So it was kind of like baked in our work the whole time, something along the lines of worker ownership. Um, and when we started, like we were a group of individual practitioners starting a nonprofit together, and so like we were talking a bit, like we were, a lot of us were like peers in a lot of ways. Uh, similar age range, similar, some, somewhat similar privileged backgrounds, or like coming to each other almost in a, a owner relationship with what we were building. And then that, and that allowed us to be a little casual about how we made decisions. A lot of us were consensus, but we weren't using that word. We were just moving forward. Um, we're 12 years old now, um, and we have a budget of about 790K. Um, I wish it was about 900K. We're struggling with finances. Um, but along that journey, like we grew budget-wise fast, staff-wise fast. Now we're, we're 12 people, half our um, salaried administrative or facilitator roles, and half our hourly. And then our work has been ongoing in our partner spaces 
we have six to eight spaces where we've been working for many years. And so for us, the actors in those spaces are also part of our dis like aim for decision making structure because they are making the work, it is their work. Um, so we're figuring that out. But like uh, our most recent trajectory though, of like we, we were kind of like went, like we're a little collective, we're making decisions together. Oh gosh, now we're hiring. And like people are coming into the organizations with different backgrounds, different ways. We kind of tried to be like cool about transparency along the way and had a lot of learnings about how that didn't work. We needed to bake in the structure. So I came in as executive director at the end of 2020, and what felt really clear to me about that was also being in the environment of, structurally, as a nonprofit, the board is my boss and gets to have the final say on everything, including my existence in that role. And I was watching other theater organizations have like staff eradicated because the board decided that's what had to happen. And we found, um, so in, in 2020, we had a community-led strategic, well not community-led, but community participated strategic planning process where it was just like, essentially the question was like, why do we have an executive director? And what else could we do? And we didn't have a lot of uh, information to go beyond that. So then as I came into the role and we were like in the chaos of COVID, we did find, we, that was a year of like just a lot of change. But in that change, finding a consultant to support us, Daniel was one of those consultants, um, for what we were just calling restructuring. Um, and then like the consultancy was, was the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, but like a 10 person group of staff and actors um, designed our plan. And it is um, towards what we learned, this model of becoming a worker self-directed nonprofit. Um, and that is a model that, like, that, that structural problem that I am really upset about, of like the board could take everything away, um, it is a change in the bylaws. So it is endowing the staff members with the key decision making processes. Yeah, yeah. That's the part where like I feel really emergency about it, and I feel like that's been harder to get staff and actors caring about that part because it's the least transparent to them. When we started this process, when I was like, are we really doing this? That was a collective decision. But part of the problem was, I had people say to me, uh, you're asking me if we should have an executive director or not, and I don't know what an executive director is or does. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, so we had to talk about that. Uh, so then, last year, uh, we had our plan, we designed implementation, uh, and also had a lot of trainings. It was like really important along the way to like, we naturally have to learn how to do collective decision making together. It is not a feel good, in, like instinctual process. Um, we have to learn the words, consensus, majority vote, super majority vote, consent, like all of these terms. We, we need to like talk about what discussion meeting process, processes will help. Um, and we need to talk about conflict and feedback. Mm -hmm. And that was also really enlightening because I think for our administrative staff who've been collaborating together through a crisis, we had navigated like what do we do when we have different ideas about what should happen next. But because we've been a transparent organization, um, our actors kind of have been like, you've always talked to us, we never have conflict. And I'm like, but that's not what conflict means. <laughs> but that was, that was where we learned in some of the trainings was people were just like, we don't need a conflict training. I'm like, uh, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Um, and, uh, and then I had to pause everything because we had a funding shortfall. Um, but we kept practicing. Like a lot of the advice we got is like, you don't have to hit the button on the new structure to start implementing, being transparent about like what, love, what kind of decision making it is, um, using like, voting or consensus for major decisions, structuring processes. Um, and actually, even before that, like we had like these, uh, a pay equity project and a participatory budgeting project in our organization in the years before. So it was all kind of in the mix. Um, and now here we are, we've been practicing, um, and we had to adjust our implementation plan. The original plan was uh, that we would have um, four circles, 
uh, operating circle, a programming circle, a care circle, and then a steering circle. And all of those circles would have levels of staff and actor representation. Um, because we don't have enough staff to manage this and money to compensate people for all of it, we are about to start next month with the staff um, membership who will be um, entering that space. So staff, not all staff have to be members. It's an opt-in thing, but it is towards that like understanding who's going to be showing up for the meetings to be informed and like participate in decisions. Um, we, I just got the list of who's interested in starting and membership. Um, we probably don't have enough people to have all those circles. So the first meeting is, okay, now what? Um, and then the hope next year is that like we are also intentionally structuring it so the actors in half of our spaces, um, and we've decided it, it's like half of our acting spaces are the ones where we have ongoing participating actors as opposed to like new people cycling in every season, um, will be included. Um, yeah. Um, so with the training, how do you make sure that that training is actually effective and being taken into account? Like with, I've had two organizations that I've worked for in the past where one, they had us do a mandatory racial diversity training. No, true story, it was Starbucks. Um, and they made us do the thing where, you know, everyone stands at the back of the room and then oh. everyone lifts all the weights you're privileged and take a step forward. And then those of us who were queer, women of color, who were raised by immigrant parents were the ones who had our backs against the wall with the least amount of privilege. It's like, thank you for reminding us that we are the most oppressed. I didn't know that yet. Um, and then the people who had the most privilege, nothing changed or I have been tasked with just teaching my executive leaders at my role before the one I'm currently in how to use Google Calendar. And even that, they said, you're asking way too much. I can't attach notes to a Google event. That's too hard. How do you make them actually take that training in and do training that doesn't objectify the people who you're doing the training for? Mm. Um, some shorter on the shorter end answers is, is doing the shopping around, um, evaluating people and, and orga facilitation organizations based on their leadership, based on like their mm, kind of like who they roll with, like um, and. Like it's been, I think, uh, a challenge for us is like, you know, we, we are a, an organization that does anti-oppression work. That doesn't mean everybody in our space is on the same page about like how oppression works. Like we, we have like such a range of experiences. And so we also, and like, we, we have to find people who can also be appropriate for our group. Um, that's a, you have a big question, but like that's my, my shortest answer is like, um, I'm losing the word for it, but like, yeah, like really doing and sharing and hearing their like their background and hear directly from staff How yeah. Does that yeah. Feel? yeah oh you hated it okay great like right part of part of what's required there is also an environment where staff know if they give input and take it seriously um and like uh, I don't, there's so much more i want to say but I, like let's i'll follow up with, with you a bit more too um I, you know, I knew we wanted to make a lot of time for Q&A, so I tried to find my essentialization of this like 12 to, you know, four to 12 year process that I feel like the organization's been on. Um, some of the sample decisions, like we did, like navigate as a whole staff. Um, do we do this, the whole process? Like, we, I opened the door for like, we say we wanna do this, but, but are we actually going to invest the time and the care and the changes along the way? Um, and that was done you know, via like proposal, some education, some follow-up with like realizing what people's real questions were, but leading up to consensus decisions. Um, and that was like what I reported to the board too. That was really important for me to say like, to tell the board, this is happening because everybody's on board. Board, board. Um, <laughs> Uh, when we moved over to Zoom, like, we were like, what is different about this work? And like, did a, a, a assess like a new compensation structure. And then 
and um, actually, what I'll, you know, that we we adopted a, what I'll share a holocratic governance process, which was a really cool resource for us. So uh, asking you about it more at another time to navigate that decision. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the harder ones I wanted to include was like, we built a, we built a policy for health and care and wellness and somebody violated it. And then like, traditionally, I was like, do I fire this person? And I was like, well, we're, you know, like this is, how, how do I talk, how do I consult with people? It doesn't, you know, we're, we're not officially there yet. Is it the time to consult with people about do we fire this person? But we had to have community conversations about like what happened and it was, you know, uh, what do we do next? Um, and it included designing a step of like that person taking some steps and that person didn't take those steps. So we fired that person um, and that was a challenging thing along the way, but it is kind of like what we're looking at when we're talking about this kind um, and so, like, uh, these are terms in, in the Freedom of the Press work, demechanization and re like, re-mechanization is not, but demechanization is, and I feel like along the whole way, this is all about, like, demechanizing, breaking our programming of, like, what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do, um, but it also has been a lot of re-mechanization, uh, absorbing the fact that, like, we're going to use this meeting format because it actually helps people know when they're going to weigh in on what. Or adopting like um, we're gonna at this point we're gonna have a circle response as a way to say like equitably like in this case it's most likely that everybody will weigh in if we say together we're gonna use a circle. Um, but like um, some of the key takeaways I would say is like if you were were you with, with Cat's group talking about making the list of key decisions is that is that did we get into that? Yeah. Yeah, the decision-making matrix, it's really how important to decide what we're gonna democratize so we're not trying to do it to everything. And the example in a session yesterday was like, does everybody have to weigh in on every newsletter? No. Um, yes, oh, this came up in, in, in this decision. A staff member said in our group process, yep, I think it's really important for me to be part of this decision, but I don't want to figure out how we make the decision together. Like, they just wanted to be able to vote at the end. And I was like, you've actually defined what my job has been for the past couple of years, which is like, I design how the decision gets made. And then sometimes I'm consulting with you. But that's, I put a little red flag there, because like, that actually isn't how it's gonna work well. Like, you want to, you weigh in with your voice at the last minute, we need the voice along the way. Um, people need to communicate their needs and be accountable to the group. Mm -hmm. um, and like, if I was doing a whole workshop about this, I would be asking you, think about when you feel comfortable saying what you need to your boss. Think about when you feel comfortable saying what you actually need to the people you supervise or manage. Like, when that, you're saying like, well, I, I'm actually not gonna say those things, it is a little bit of a block to these structures for working. Um, and then accountability is a whole other thing. And it, it won't work for some people. Like I have been working with people who like wouldn't like to communicate or wouldn't be accountable and it, it doesn't work. Um, and yeah, now kind of along the way, my, my role as an executive director, which I still am, is like I'm stewarding what the group wants. So it's a different accountability from like the organization is going to do this because I, as leadership, say so to like the organization is going to do this because this group of people in the organization said so. Uh, and it really changes things. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we are just about at time yeah. somehow. Uh, so I'm going to ask if you take one and pass it down. Yeah. So these are just some quick evaluations that we're gonna ask you all to fill out. We're always iterating on this workshop and how we lead it, so it's really helpful for us to get feedback from y'all. Um, it's pretty quick. One side is just a scale of one to five, so the question is the other is a little bit more sort of ended. Um, part of what I'll offer is, uh, so um, 
we, obviously, as we mentioned, um, uh, we consult on this work. It's part of how we make our money. So if you are interested in learning more about how you might uh, adopt more democratic practices, if you want to talk about that in your creative processes, if you want to talk about that administratively, we're here for that. You can always reach out to us to get a free 30-minute consultation as a starting point. We're always happy to share whatever resources we have, all that good stuff. Um, but so if you want to learn more and you want us to reach out to you, just write your name or contact and contact information onto that sheet of paper and we'll reach out to you within the next couple of weeks um, if you feel ready for that. If you're uh, around either later this evening or tomorrow, uh, I'll be here. So I'm happy to take out some office hours. Feel free to just come up and find me and chat with me after this session if you want to spend some time to like chat a little bit more. I'm always here for that. I love talking shop. Um, yeah, we have uh, all of the resources plus some others, uh, and including one specifically about conflict and accountability and worker self-directed nonprofits here up front. So please feel free to peruse all the resources. We also have some of these extra games from our care package that you can come and just take one if you want to. Uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but yeah, just um, if you can fill out that email, but that's it. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, we'll put on some music or something like that. Uh, but yeah, feel free to hang out. I think that was happening.